And thanks again for joining us here on the Gill Athletics Connections podcast, bringing you coaches from well, literally around the world. Last week, we had a coach from Canada. If you haven't been able to check that one out, please go back and listen. We had a great time uh, with Coach uh, Kurt Downs from uh, Border City Athletic Club. Today, we're going to go back across the border. We're going to come across from the Canadian border. We're going to go to Michigan. Uh, we're just going to stay up north uh, here as we, uh, as we move into 2021. I can't believe that we're actually that you guys are still listening. This was started in January of 2020 on a whim. I just wanted to explore and get on record the amazing coaches that we have here in this country and around the world. And uh, just so blessed that as we are sitting here in January of 2021, that you're still here. Uh, we're one of the top 20 podcasts in the country for running. That amazes me. And uh, we're well over 30,000 downloads, which Again, never could have seen it. And I thank you for being here and listening to us today. And today's guest, I know, is going to knock your socks off. Uh, so super excited. Help me welcome head coach of Northwood University in Michigan, uh, Mr. Michael Roberts. Michael, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, man. You were very patient during that long-winded intro. I'm so thankful. <laughs> uh, hey, so uh, tell me, Let's start with, I am actually not very familiar with Northwood University. So let's start there. Talk to us about uh, you being the head coach there, the university. Just tell us a little bit about your program. Okay, yeah. Um, Northwood University is a private business institution in Midland, Michigan. We, um, <clears throat> we deal mainly with business. We have um, over about 16 majors that you know deal with business. We have aftermarket aftermarket um, marketing, entrepreneurship, um, automotive. Um, one thing that we're really known for here in, in Midland is um, our auto show. Uh, we have a lot of students that um, put on that event where it's the largest um, outdoor auto show in um, the Midwest and our students is student run. And um, um, <laughs> Sorry, just kind of freezing a little bit. But yeah, no, Midland, Michigan, it's a small private business institution. It's a very small family feel. We are in the um, GLIAC. So we have oh, in our yeah. conference, we have, um, you know, Ashland, Grand Valley, um, Saginaw Valley, um, Michigan Tech, Northern Michigan, um, Lake Superior State. So we're in a very competitive conference in our um, conference um, as well. So yeah, Northwood is a, it's a good school. It's a very small school. So if you're looking for um, not the big university feel. We have a very smaller size campus with a very family feel. So I think Northwood University is a good school for students that are obviously interested in business, but are also looking for, um, you know, more of a local small town family feel type of um, university or family feel. So tell me, you know, Michigan is famous for the, the mitten, right? Like if I hold up my hand, yeah. that's the state. So where in Michigan is Midland, Michigan, Northwood University? Where is that at? So Midland, Michigan is typically around right here. I learned that when I moved to Michigan that everybody does the little thumb, the little hand thing here. So Midland, Michigan is here. They kind of consider we're almost like in a valley. So we're about right here. We're about um, two hours from Detroit. Um, so we're not too far. I'm very centrally located in Michigan, about two hours from Detroit, two hours from Grand Rapids. Um, and Lansing and so yeah I was gonna say where in relation to like East Lansing like Eastern Michigan and Michigan State where are you at in relation to that? Michigan State 90 minutes oh, yeah. Michigan State is about 90 minutes University of Michigan about an hour 45 so are you um, more, from are, here so are you more north of them or where are you at we're more north yeah okay more north yeah and how many students there at uh, Northwood uh, well, right now, I think with obviously with COVID going on, um, we are roughly around on campus. We're about a thousand students. Yeah, very cool. And you mentioned the GLIAC, so Division mm -hmm. Two, and GLIAC uh, might be one of the more famous. Uh, I was going to say famous Division Two track conferences, but maybe just famous track conferences. Because uh, holy smokes, I remember when the Finleys and um, was Tiffin used to Tiffin be in was in the conference, yeah. Man, you would look at the GLIAC results and they would look exactly mm -hmm. like the NCAA national championship results because they'd be a lot in the same. I remember one year, I think seven of eight of the shot putters and maybe all eight were all from that conference. It was mm -hmm. 
I mean, it was mind blowing. It's like, holy cow, what a conference. And still is an amazing conference with mm-hmm. this and uh, what everybody's doing in that conference. That's for sure. So how did you get to Northwood? How long have you been there? And what is your background as far as coaching? So I got in Northwood, I arrived in Northwood in October, 2014. Um, and I've been here since then. Um, before I got to Northwood, I was at Indiana State, my alma mater. I did my undergrad there as well as my graduate school at Indiana State. Um, and uh, while I was at Indiana State, I um, you know, got into graduate school, um, got, did my graduate school. I was really supposed to do exercise physiology, but ended up switching it to um, physical education, emphasis in coaching. And with that, we was, I was able to have an internship with the track and field program, obviously at Indiana State with um, the legendary John McNichols. And oh, yeah. uh, during that time, the uh, sprint coach, Jeff Waiton, took a head coaching job down at Rose Holman. And, you know, as, um, you know, Coach John McNichols is such a visionary, he used that opportunity to use a graduate program and the graduate assistance and, you know, have me step in to fill in for um, the sprinters during that time. And um, during that time, um, we had a lot of success with the sprinters there. I ended up coaching um, Katie Weiss to fifth place at the national championships indoors. And then we also had several athletes. Um, I think we believe as a, as a whole, we had about 14 athletes qualify for the outdoor championships. And then after that, we had athletes as well at the USA championships. And I was a part of that as well. Um, and under Coach McNichols' guidance, he allowed us to go to the coaching convention. Um, I believe that year, I think it was in Orlando. Uh, um, and I just think that indoor national championships, I was at the USA championship, so I was present. And I think once I graduated, that gave me the opportunity to, um, you know, start the job process, you know, doing the networking at the USA convention, um, USA CTF convention. And, um, you know, when I was the, at Indiana State, you know, I had the mindset that I was division one. I. I wanted to be a division one coach. And I did. I had I had um, several offers and schools look at me during that time. But um, division two really opened up the doors for me. And I had several um, opportunities here. And then I ended up getting gaining opportunity here at Northwood University as an assistant coach. Um, and in my time here at Northwood, our head coach at the time, was here for one year and then he stepped down and then we did the whole hiring process and bringing in coaches and um, I started off as interim head coach during that time um, and then we ended up hiring another head coach and then that head coach decided to leave that I actually ended up becoming the head coach so I've been the head coach here since um, I would say December of 2015. Well, you know, that, that's a great story about perseverance. <laughs> uh, you know, as, <laughs> yeah. as the coaches come through, you could have easily given up and quit and gone on somewhere else, but you, you kept sticking through. You obviously believed in the program and this, in the location that you, you wanted to be there and then, uh, and eventually be there as the head coach. Mm-hmm. So it sounded like, cause this is interesting. So you went to Northwood as the assistant coach and through some different um, uh, leaving and, and what have you, uh, became the head coach in a fairly short amount of time. Did you, did you think you'd be a head coach at this age and stage of your career? You know, no, I didn't. And, you know, just listening and from good advice, to, sometimes they say to become a, a head coach, you have to be at the right place at the right time. Um, you know, and I think that's true for everybody. And I think for me, I was at the right place at the right time um, for that transition. And I just showed loyalty here. And, you know, I, once I came to Northwood, we, you know, I made an immediate impact here with the student athletes and administration here. And, um, you know, and when we were doing the hiring process, bringing other coaches, I had a lot of administration here fighting for me to actually be, become the, the head coach here that in the trial and error of, of actually trying to find a head coach, my boss, Dave Marsh, we had a conversation was like, you know, that was my sign that I should have um, give you the job initially and then you know I took over the job and I've uh, been here ever since and we've done pretty well as a as a university and a yeah. program. I'm amazed sometimes it's hard for us to see things that are right in front of our face. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, sometimes we're trying to see around it to find that other head coach or that other uh, what have you and sometimes the answer is smacking you right there in the face. I'm glad you were the answer right there in your face <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. to eventually lead this program. So at this age and stage of your career, being a head coach, you know, being a head coach is different 
than being an assistant coach. Uh, were you prepared to be the head coach? What struck you the most uh, that you just didn't see coming when you took over the program? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I was, I, I had good leadership. I think at Indiana State um, with, you know, the current director there, Angela Martin and Jeff Martin, I just had really good guidance um, from them as well and just kind of learning. Um, and while I was at Indiana State, we've done so much. I mean, they hosted the, you know, Division One Cross Country National Championships. Um, John McNichols and um, Coach Garland were both visionaries. And so I just had I just had good leadership and mentorship from them at Indiana State as a whole and their organizational skills and um, just everything that I've learned while being there, I think kind of helped prepare me to come to Division II and, you know, provide those organizational skills and just be able to handle um, being a head coach at such a, you know, very early on in my career. So, um, and not only that, I just think I've learned and obviously got my master's in physical education emphasis in coaching. So I did have a little bit of educational background and leadership and um, how to take over the program. So I wasn't too overwhelmed. <laughs> well, you're still there. So it must not have been too overwhelming. You, you survived right. and thrived, right? <laughs> um, do you have a, a staff? Oh, yes, we do have a staff. How has that been? I'm interested in, you know, there's hiring and firing of staff. Oh, I haven't yeah. fired anybody, but, you know, you have to have hiring principles and it can't always be, and maybe sometimes it's a mistake when it's someone that you just naturally like, like there needs to be other skill sets that maybe you're looking for in your staff. How has that process been with staff evaluations? Um, hiring, it, it, it hasn't been too difficult here. You know, usually when you're hiring, you have, you know, good counseling coaches that recommend other coaches that will be a good fit for university or uh, where you are. Um, you originally had Coach Zach Ball on the podcast originally. He was um, one of the assistant coaches that came in with me with our previous head coach, and then he obviously moved on. And so after that, that was my first time um, opening up the doors to start the hiring process. And um, once our, my first hiring process was when our head coach stepped down, I had to bring in a, a distance coach and we um, hired coach Jeremy Wilk, who again was groomed under um, coach Jerry Baltus down at Grand Valley. So again, he had um, a good experience as an athlete and, you know, um, coming from Grand Valley and learning that. So I think he was a good addition to add to our team as well. Um, and then once coach Ball left, we hired uh, Marcus Myers, who was from Walsh. He was a former national champion for them. And so I think that added well to what we were looking for. And uh, just for me in the hiring process, I think as a head coach, you have to hire assistant coaches that have skills that you lack um, and also bring in coaches that have the same mindset that you have. And I think our mindset here was when I originally got to Norfolk University, we were, um, I would say we were the, the doormat of the conference. <laughs> so I would say that we were the doormat of the conference, but um, bringing in those coaches here, we definitely want to make a change and and to really improve on our competitiveness. Because again, we have coaches like Dre Fox at Grand Valley and um, Judd at Ashland. And, you know, for us, it was our goal to um, just stand out, you know, and, and to make a difference within um, our conference. And our school's motto is to go mad and to make a difference. And that's one thing that we kind of strive for just to make a difference and really work hard as a as a staff and have that camaraderie to give our student athletes an experience and, um, and just give them experience to succeed. Um, you know, our men's program has done has done fairly well. Um, we ended up, I think our highest place finish we did indoors was 13th. We finished 13th as a team for the indoor national championships. And you know, you kind of mentioned when uh, when I first got to GLIAC, we had schools like Tiffin, Findlay, um, Hillsdale, um, all of the schools in our conference. We had at least four or five schools in our conference that were top 10 in the nation. And the one thing that I always said is, why can't we? If we got, if it's right here in our backyard and this is the competition that we have, then why can't we strive to do the same? And so that's kind of been our motto is why can't we? I why can't we? Why love can't we? So. That attitude. Why, that why can't we, why can't, uh, and, and boil it down to the individual coach or athlete, why not me? I, I love that. What a, what a, uh, a way to challenge the status quo. And instead of coming in there and saying, well, we're in the, one of the arguably toughest conferences in the nation, well, maybe we're supposed to be seventh or eighth in the conference. And, you know, you know, if we get 15th, that'll be okay. That'd be amazing. But instead, well, wait a minute, those guys and gals are doing it. And you named some 
amazing coaches, right? JB and Judd and, and there's many more, uh, mm -hmm. but you're right. They, they all had to start somewhere as well. So why can't we at Northwood? I love that attitude. That really, that really struck out, uh, stuck out there. So something else you said that was really interesting to me when you're talking about staffing and hiring and, and um, staffing evaluations, you mentioned something that a lot of coaches uh, and really a lot of professional people as well uh, in the private sector don't learn until much, much later in their career. You said that when you're hiring a staff, when you're hiring assistant coaches, you have to find people who have strengths and things that you're weak at. I'm kind of paraphrasing mm -hmm. how you said it, uh, but that's a, that's a fairly large self-awareness statement that you made there that you have to realize, oh, wait a minute, I don't, I'm not strong in everything. So if we're going to be good as a program, I need to go, go, go out and get people who are strong in those areas. What areas do you find yourself as weaknesses that you have to uh, find other good assistant coaches to come in and, and help you with? Um, areas that I find myself, I'm, I am not huge on social media. Social media is not, you know, and I would consider myself somebody who should, but I am not very big on social media. Um, if you check out my Twitter, I think sometimes, if you listen to my tweets, I think I start tweeting like, you know, hey, I tweet once a year. And that was my tweet. But I'm um, just finding coaches that really have a knack for that. Um, yeah. And to Northwood University is such a, a, niche school that I think the season coaches that we have in here with them being from division two had a lot of strengths and um, areas within the division two world that I didn't have because again I was you know a division one athlete and uh, division one coach starting out and so um, bringing in those coaches uh, they definitely had a lot of information on the division two level that I didn't have as far as like you know, what student athletes are looking for. Cause I think, you know, with some student athletes, it, it, even in my day growing up, it was division one or bust, you know? And so coming to the division two um, level, it was more so about getting, bringing in coaches and, and finding those coaches who had, um, you know, high esteem for the division two level and finding those student athletes and giving me information on how to go about recruiting and getting those student athletes to want to be a part of a program. Um, and uh, do those things. So for me, things that I lacked, um, it's just, I'm still a very young coach. So I honestly don't know everything that I do lack. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a forever evolving learning curve. And, um, you know, for me, I just kind of take every, everything one day at a time. Cause again, I don't know it all, you know, <laughs> the only thing that I concern about is making sure that I give not only my assistant coaches experience, the student athletes as well. And I think having all those different minds and coaches who have a different personality outside of mine can kind of help find the balance to have a more well-rounded um, coaching staff. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question I threw at you there. You, you did great, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, another thing that you touched on there, though, is, is, is as, as important as it is to understand your weaknesses so that you can go out and get a staff that will help you with it, knowing what your strengths are is important as well. You know, so you mentioned, you know, being able to relate to the athletes and uh, those kind of things. And obviously, you must have some kind of organizational skills because of the head coach, all the paperwork and, and what have you. Um, but you also have a skill you didn't you showed it right there, but you didn't necessarily say it. Uh, but the the understanding about getting other people, other coaches who went through division two. So what you mentioned there is authenticity. You're like, oh, I don't mm -hmm. have that. I, I don't know what the division two level is all about. I wasn't in it. However, you realize how important that is for the program. So you go out and get that. That's uh, mm -hmm. that's key. That, that That's leadership maybe is exactly what that definition is right there is the leadership, the knowledge that, oh, okay, I don't know it all. Well, then I better get other people to help me out. And but as a staff, we will know it all <laughs> or, or a lot more. Right, anyway. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Hey, uh, and, and put a pin on John McNichols, because I definitely want to talk about John. Uh, you mentioned uh, other mentors and stuff that you, you know, um, ask questions of and ask for help and things like that. Who are some mentors that have helped you along the way here at Northwood? Uh, since I've been here at Northwood, um, you know, I mentors that I've had since I've been here at Northwood have I, I always have to go back to my alma mater and the people that I met while I was at graduate school and our graduate professors, um, as well as people that I met while I was in high school. My high school coach, I went to from so I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I went to Lawrence Central. And at the time, the head coach there was Mike Coleman, um, and so Mike Coleman has been very instrumental for me as a mentor and. Um, we may not speak all the time, but I, but I, I do observe, I do watch, um, and he's, he has just been kind of very instrumental for me because, 
Um, I ended up going to Chula Vista for the Emerging Elite Coaches Camp uh, when I was, you know, trying to, you know, figure out life and figure out what I wanted to do. And um, he had, I think it was the, the grant or a scholarship that you had applied to. And I realized that he was over that. So I reached out to him and I applied and I ended up getting that grant and that scholarship. And I, I ended up going down to Chula Vista training camp and um, meeting all those coaches, I ended up meeting, you know, Jeremy Fisher was there and, you know, seeing some of those Olympic level athletes. So that just kind of really opened up my eyes to um, connect more with people that I didn't know who probably had a different understanding than me as far as coaching, competitiveness, what's it really all about, what's it not about. Um, <laughs> so I love that, man. Mike Holman, uh, what a great guy. Uh, we'll get to him as well. That's, that's amazing. Okay. Um, Talk to me about John McNichols, though. So John McNichols is a uh, uh, more than a legend and uh, very big in my life and coaching and through my career as well. In fact, he was the uh, at the time when I was coaching, he was one of the national hurdle coaches for USATF. Mm -hmm. He actually plugged me into Mike Coleman and I, I was the national junior uh, high hurdle coach for for USATF. So I got to bring the best 19 and under high hurdlers to Chula Vista <laughs> uh, and work with them. So we had, you know, okay. amazing athletes. Uh, Ted Ginn, uh, you know, who's in the NFL now and Justin Gavin mm -hmm. was there and just amazing, amazing people. Uh, but John McNichols is, uh, you know, he has touched so many people's lives, uh, obviously so many athletes, but coaches as well. Talk to me about what he did for you as an athlete and graduate coach and assistant coach. What, what was his... Uh, effect over you his effect on me was I just as I said I, I'm a I'm a huge observer I'm not I'm not a big talker if you know me I'm more quiet a little bit more reserved but I'm a huge observer and well, well thank goodness I got you on a podcast then if you're not much of a talker oh man this, <laughs> this might have been a mistake we're going to drag these uh sentences out of him folks <laughs> <laughs> no problem um but you know coach John McNichols um and just everybody's experience is different with everyone but just John McNichols has always been very level-headed very patient. I don't think I've, I think I've maybe seen him get flustered once um, out of, you know, the six years that I was there from undergrad to graduate school, but he was just a, such a huge visionary. And once we was in graduate school, he allowed, he really used um, any opportunity, any helping hand that he could use, he utilized that. And he gave everyone that was around him an opportunity and experience to learn um, and he was just very, uh, very open coach. I just remember sitting in the, the coach's staff meetings and um, just observing him and how he, you know, we had staff meetings where he allowed the coaches to express themselves and he allowed the coaches to say things that I think some coaches and other programs may be afraid to say to their boss and, you know, to be able to have that that openness with your coaching staff and allow them to, you know, express themselves and still be level, still be very level headed and not micromanage and just keep everything um just very calm he's just a very very calm very very calm coach and um for me i think i learned a lot more from him once i actually got into graduate school and i was and i ended up taking over the sprints um crew and um going with him to the coaches convention and i actually had to room with him um that time when we went to coaches convention and um, that time that we was there was very profound for me because I remember him telling me that, all right, you guys are here at convention, you are here to network. So he was like, you have to be out of this room <laughs> by 9 a.m. and you cannot come back to this room until about nine o'clock. You need to be out there, you need to network, you need to learn. Um, and just from that experience and the conversations that I had with him during that time was extremely profound for me that he just kind of actually you know, pushed me out there. Cause again, I, I was in graduate school, still very young. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And right. um, just having him as a mentor, just for me, I keep saying, it's just, it was very profound in just my upbringing and um, the things that I wanted to do as a coach and um, the things that I took away from him and from coach John Garland and Angie McNichols and kind of helped molded me to, you know, being the, the coach that I am and, um, to how kind of how I handle my staff and how I handle, um, you know, my organizational skills and, and, you know, working with the administration here and being involved and trying to have that same type of visionary um, stats that he did because he, he was an extreme visionary. Hmm. Uh, speaking of that networking, is that something you struggled with? 
Uh, networking, you know, I, I kind of, you know, networking is, you know, people feel like now you got to go and talk to all these people. Sometimes if you have the right conversation with the right person, that's all the networking that you need. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think for me being an introvert um, and coming from, you know, Indiana State is a mid-major school and going to the convention and meeting them. I actually met people at convention that helped expand my networking base. Um, I ended up meeting my best friend at convention, I think it was 2013, which is oh. Jarius Cooper, who's now at um, Stanford Cooper, uh, University. You, so you consider Coop your best friend? Jarius Cooper is my best friend. And that tells me everything I need to know about you. I love him. He is awesome. <laughs> I is one of the okay. best guys in the whole wide world and a phenomenal coach, by the way, uh, yes. but, but an even better person. That's awesome. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah, so you know Jarius Cooper. Yeah, he is he is he is my best friend. We have um communicated every day, you know, iron sharpens iron and um, you know, we've been with each other throughout our journeys and our career. And um he's he himself has been, you know, very monumental to me as well. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I think with networking, a lot of times we because you mentioned about you know the right person, the right conversation. And sometimes we think of networking as, oh gosh, I've got to go meet a hundred people, uh, you know, which is easy to do at convention, honestly. But uh, but it's not about necessarily quantity. It's sometimes uh, maybe even more importantly about quality, you know, what mm -hmm. are you meeting, uh, and also your posture. And I think, you know, just from sensing our conversation here and uh, what I know about you, you know, some people go through networking and they're trying to get something from the other people, right? You, you kind of come at a posture of, oh, well, I'm, I'm not here to get something from you. Like, that's kind of like, what can I give you? What, what can I have right. to the conversation? It's, it's a, a transaction, not a, what, I just want to have you as my mentor. Or I just want you for, an, uh, for a job reference or you to tell me what jobs are open and all the other kind of stuff. You, you, uh, you see that kind of both ways side of networking. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. Uh, so yeah. John McNichols. And, and you mentioned so many people, you know, Gartland and Jeff and Angela now is the head coach. Uh, you know, we, we're very, very dear friends with Indiana State uh, crew. In fact, one of our longtime employees here, uh, one of my good friends, Brian Carell, is an Indiana State alum. So we get to uh, have, have a little fun with the football team during season and when they're not doing They used to not do so well. But they actually, yeah. we were there where they, there was a time not too long ago. We were, I, when I was there, we were the worst football yes. team in the, in the nation. Like the Owen... 30 mm -hmm. or something like several years. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to, uh, I used to coach at Ball State. And before I got to Ball State, they were the 0 and 30 team, you know. Uh, and when they finally won, David Letterman is a Ball State alum. And so he, mm -hmm. like, you know, gave him a shout out on the David Letterman show and whatnot. It's not fun when you're 0 and 30, man. 0 and 10. No, it's not. Enough, right? <laughs> 0 and 30. That's, that's not fun. Uh, so you also mentioned you went to Powerhouse Lawrence Central for high school. Holy cow, man. Uh, Used to recruit Lawrence Central and uh, a bunch of other Pike and those uh, those guys and gals down there in Indianapolis a lot. Uh, and, and Holman was your your coach. He was my coach. You kind of have coaching pedigree. <laughs> your high school coach, your college coaches. Holy cow! What what did you notice? Because those two are actually very similar to me uh, in, their, mm -hmm. in their demeanor. Holman and, and, and McNichols. Did you? Is that what attracted you to Indiana State? Kind of the similarities of your high school coach to college coach, or what? What? How did you go from Lawrence Central to Indiana State? Oh man. Um, well, you know, as a as a as a child, a young youth, um, you know, my only goal during that time was to get a scholarship and to go to college. And um, my my family, my father was in the Air Force, so he was growing up. So we ended up living. Um, was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. So we ended up. Moving to California, I did, grew up there, I lived in California until I was maybe about six years old, and then after California, we moved to Arkansas, and after Arkansas, we moved back to Indianapolis, where we started middle school in Indianapolis, and, um, you know, I kind of dibbled and dabbled in several sports, and, you know, I was in middle school, I always ran the 800, they, they, they only put me in the 800, they only put me in the mile, um, and then I, I did a little bit of wrestling here and there, and then once I got to Indiana, not Indiana, so once I got to Lawrence Central, uh, I started running track and field there. My sister was a huge track and field star at the time, too, who ran there. Um, and I just remember being at Indiana, not Indiana, so being at Lawrence Central, and we were stretching, and Mike Coleman was like, you know, go be with the hurdlers. And so I ended up joining the hurdles and ended up qualifying for the state championships as a hurdler, and then wait, wait, that kind of... So did you... 
why did he go say go hang out with the hurt like did, did you show like i want to be a hurdler or was this some kind of gifting like you know almost <laughs> like you are going to be a hurdler go no i think i just think i, I want to i want to say i was a riffraff but you know they ended up winning they ended up winning like the um the state championships i believe it was in maybe uh oh five oh six i'm not sure when they won the state championships and um they had we had so many athletes on the team at that time i don't think i was one of the ones that you know he was particularly paying attention to the most but i just remember we were stretching and he was like go join the hurdlers what and you, i ended up joining the hurdlers what did you think when he said that were you excited or were you like i, oh, I will do God. anything except run the mile in the 800. <laughs> i would do anything i hated <laughs> running the 800 i hated running the mile and that seems to be the event that i always ran and my sister was a sprinter so i was like well if she's a sprinter well she's older so she's a sprinter i'm a sprinter so i tried to do the sprints and we were stretching one day and he told me to go join the hurdles so i ended up joining the hurdles and um fell in love with the hurdles and became very successful at the the hurdles and obviously indiana state was huge for hurdles i ended up going to indiana state to yeah 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 be a hurdler. That, no one wants to hear that we all want to hear how was hurdle practice <laughs> day number one <laughs> How was hurdle practice day number one? Day number one, when you first got to Oh, man. Hurdles. So I remember day number one, and um, I, I tell the guy all the time that he was extremely monumental. And if it wasn't for that one particular moment, I probably wouldn't be where I am. But there was a guy uh, when we was in high school that um, I just remember going to hurdle practice. And he was like, oh, you're doing the hurdles. He's like, well, you'll never beat me. I was like, oh, it's OK. <laughs> and then he told me that I would never beat him. And I didn't focus on anything else. I don't even think I focused on learning the hurdle skill. I was only focused on beating this one athlete on my team who was actually very good at the hurdles at the time. And 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 in all in all, trying to beat him, I ended up, you know, qualifying for the state championships and you know being very good at nice. the hurdles. Let's say because of him with the rest is history. <laughs> so you did you did beat him. I did beat them. Yes. Nice. <laughs> hey, you know, I love that. There's some competitiveness coming out uh, of you there. Yeah. This, this guy told you, you'll never beat me. And you're like, all right, bet it's on. We'll, we'll see. Oh yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So were you more of a uh, short hurdler or a long hurdler? Short hurdler. <laughs> wait, wait, short wait. hurdler. You said that like short the 300 hurdler. hurdles is like the 800 and the mile. Short, 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 short hurdles, short hurdles. And I mean, and, and the, the same thing kind of transitioned the same thing at Indiana State. I was, we, we, Coach McNichols always attracted some of the best hurdlers in, um, you know, the nation to come to the school. And, you know, I, I kind of kept that same attitude. And, you know, growing up, I always wanted to, you know, be seen. I wanted acknowledgement. I wanted the coaches to say my name. I, I wanted the coaches to, um, you know, see some value in me. I think that's, you know, and now as a coach, I really understand the importance and the value of growth because that's been, you know, just how I've brought up into the sport was, you know, trying to prove myself, trying to get them to say, hey, he's going to be one of our, you know, best hurdlers or hey, or want them to kind of speak about me or, you know, I just wanted to be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does that stem from? Um, well, you know, I think that stems from just growing up. I have a twin brother. Um, I'm the oldest twin. So my wow. younger twin brother seemed to do everything before me. He was able to talk before me. He was able to walk before me. He was able to do stuff before me. And I've always, um, you know, I don't know. I just kind of remember that. And then, you know, just being, I, I want to be seen. I want mm -hmm. to be acknowledged. I want to, um, you know, work hard just to, you know, Get what I believe that I deserve, which is I just want to be, you know, acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your older sister was uh, in track, and you mm -hmm. alluded that maybe she was. You said she was really good. Did you say she was a superstar? What What was your words? You uh, she was a state champion. Um, she ended up going to um, Ball State, and she wanted to become oh. a nurse. Um, her name was Janae Middleton at the time. Yeah. Um, Janae Roberts, Janae Middleton, and then she wanted to become a nurse and went to Ball State, but they told her that she couldn't be a nurse and do track and field. So she dropped out and um, Coach Jeff Waiton at Indiana State picked her up. Um, and so she ended up going to Indiana State to run. And what, then I was in high school and I... What year What year did she graduate high school? She graduated high school, I believe in 2000, 
five. Okay, it was after me. I want to make sure I wasn't to blame mm -hmm. here. I was like, I don't think I. Told <laughs> okay, I wasn't to blame. I was already gone by that point. Um, did your your younger twin brother? No, by the way, in twins, you notice how he said, "I'm the older twin brother." The younger twin brother never mentions the birth order. Always the older one mentions the birth order. Oh yeah, you had to get that out real quick. Like I, I'm, yeah, the, I'm the oldest twin. Yes. I'm the oldest. <laughs> Did uh did your uh, the younger twin did did he also do track? He did he did do track he um he he was a high jumper uh, he ended up catching a hernia and then you know, the rest was history so <laughs> I stayed with it and you kind of had a little smile there when you said that <laughs> there's, there's, there's that brotherly that sibling rivalry there right there <laughs> yeah I love it I love it gotta have, hey if you you know, to, to get move forward, you got to have those goals. And sometimes that goal is beating that person on your track team, that, that hurdler that said you were never going to beat them, uh, that goal mm -hmm. to make it division one, whatever you're good. You got to have goals, man. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> so when did, uh, did you go to college thinking you wanted to be a track coach or when did coaching become an idea for you as a career? You know, going to college, I just knew that I wanted to go to college. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, be in the city. And um, I, for me, I, I thought that going to college was going to be able to give me opportunities to get out of the city and to do things as I got older. But I never really had an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, you know, when I got to college, I was in athletic training and, um, you know, eventually went from athletic training to physical therapy and then from physical therapy to exercise science. And all I knew is that I wanted to work with people, but I wanted to work with healthy people and not work with, you know, the, mm -hmm. um, what's considered the sick and shut in. And um, <clears throat> it was kind of a nerd because I really got into exercise physiology and I really loved that. Um, and I remember going to graduate school, I had the option of doing exercise physiology or coaching. And with exercise physiology, you had to do a dissertation. And so I didn't want to do a dissertation. And so I ended up um, switching it to physical education, exercise science, emphasis in coaching. Um, but while in that state, I was just involved with the, the track team there. You know, I was a student athlete there and then going into graduate school um, and then them bringing in the graduate students there who, you know, became my best friends at that time. And um, once I, I really think it was once um, Coach Waiton took the head coaching job down at Rose Holman and I was got the opportunity to take over the sprinters in that time was when I realized that, hey, you know, I was going to be really good at coaching because my first experience as a coach within the, the second year was, you know, having Katie Weiss get fifth at the Division One Indoor National Championships and then having all those athletes qualify outdoors. Um, and then going to USA. So I was exposed very early on in my coaching career to um, a very elite level. Um, and then after graduate school, um, you know, I wanted to be a teacher, um, but I just was in, in, immersed into coaching that I just stayed with it. I didn't really choose to do anything else um, after that. And so that's kind of how I decided to um, be with coaching and stick with coaching. Yeah. Some people are pulled into it. Some people resist it. You feel like, uh, I'm sorry, you, it sounds like you feel like you were almost like just at the right place at the right time. Like, oh, okay, you went to graduate school at Indiana State where you did your undergrad. And then when coach left to go to Wabash, oh, okay, that opened up that position. And then you gained some confidence with the results from the athletes that mm -hmm. you were coaching. Mm. I mean, it's all the same thing that I wanted to do. I always knew that I wanted to help people you know or doing exercise physiology or exercise science it was you know helping people become better helping people you know improve performance or if with exercise physiology if they you know prescribing exercise just doing things to help people and i still found that and so as a coach you know as a coach we're all mentors and our job is to provide an experience and help the student athletes accomplish mm -hmm. their goals you know our, our job is to help them guide their stride <laughs> Oh my, who gave you, did you come up with that? I've never heard I did. Uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, my job is to help you guide your stride. I think most coaches are want to be rappers. They always have these flowing, the guide your stride and all that. That, that was pretty good. I hadn't heard that one before. I might, I might have to, I can't steal it because I don't coach anybody's stride, but I like that one. Guide. Yeah, nobody has said that. I'm the I, first one. <laughs> I've not heard that. That, that is a first for me. Guide your stride. Uh, well, it definitely sounds like, you know, what you're talking about there, coaching the athletes and you're there to guide them and help them uh, and make them feel valid and, and worthy and, and, uh, and such. And you're getting that probably reciprocal as, as, you know, what you give is what you get, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're giving that to your athletes, I'm assuming 
you know, you're getting a lot of great feedback from your athletes as far as how you're doing oh, as yeah. a coach and a leader and a mentor for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've had some amazing ones in front of you. <laughs> Again, I go back to McNichols and Holman and uh, just so many. Um, I'm really impressed with your coaching uh, uh, mentorship, like who you've been around. Oh, thank you. That's really impressive. Uh, and this is where the introvert part of the uh, uh, interview where I've got to stop asking him yes or no questions. I've got to get him to uh, open up. To uh, speak, right? Yeah, because I'm be like, yes, no. <laughs> You're like, yes, that's right. No, that's wrong. <laughs> that's exactly it. Well, let's talk about Michael. Um, uh, again, super impressed. You're you know, very young in your career, but doing a lot of amazing things. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, concerned with for coaches is it's one of the few professions out there where we are 24-7. Right. You know, your athletes mm -hmm. are always available to get a hold of you in good times and sometimes bad and things like that. Uh, what do you do to get away from the profession? And I know that's hard, right? Coach follows you everywhere. Right. But what are some of the things you like to do off the track? Uh, you know, as a, it's, you always got to find things to where you keep yourself challenged. And, you know, I think everything is coaching. Everything is skill. I like to, you know, play the guitar. You know, I like to. Uh, sing. I like to, um, you know, do things like that. Um, and I just like to, you know, because I know with coaches, we spend so much of our time focusing on coaching and training and training philosophy and so much that we actually don't spend time learning something else um, that I actually do a lot of time of just um, diving into other books, diving into other things that maybe I, you know, haven't learned about or, or haven't looked at before and just trying to always keep my eyes open and expand my horizon. You know, one thing that I heard, I think Allison Felix posted, which was never arrive, you know, never arrive, never sit there and focus on one thing all the time. Always continue to focus on something else and never really truly fully arrive. And that really resonated with me. So outside of coaching, I like to just do other things that, you know, like when I have my coaching friends and we talk and one thing that I hate is if we're on the phone, if they start talking about recruiting, if they start talking about coaching, I'm going to hang up the phone. Nobody wants to talk. This is what we do for a living. I don't want to talk about coaching. Let's talk about other stuff. We have personal lives. We have yes. things um, yes. going on, you know. So, um, yeah, just for me, I, I like to play the guitar. I like to do um, other things like that. Um, but again, I'm still fairly young. You know, I'm still learning myself as I go along with this mm -hmm. process too. You know, I'm I'm coaching, but I'm still being coached as an individual yeah. um, in this game called life. So that's right. What kind of uh, music do you like playing and singing? Um, well, you know, I like to. So I like more neo soul type of music, and usually when it comes to me playing guitar music, I typically try not to listen to everybody else. I usually try to pick up the guitar and play what oh. I feel or play what comes natural to me and I kind of take that into everything which is don't really focus on what the next person is doing because in doing that you lose yourself hmm. um and kind of learned that from convention too because we go to convention every year to you know sit in, in the rooms and, and listen how the coaches are doing certain things and you know I've, I've always had you know a problem of, of you know being very cookie cutterish in ways because I think everybody has something unique to offer. Yes. Um, and yes. with all the books and all the books and all the philosophies out there, go create your own. You know, it's go create your own. Who's to say that what you create doesn't work? If it works for you, then it then it works. And so you shouldn't be focused on what the next person is doing. You should be focused on giving your best. And out of giving your best, you should be able to get the results that you need. And then maybe somebody else will come to you and ask you how you did it. So that is a major reason why I started this podcast was that exact there. Everybody has their own path, their own uniqueness Two coaches that you may think grew up in the same era, coached in the same style of coaches, maybe the same events and things like that. And they couldn't be two more different people, right? We're all mm -hmm. extremely unique. Uh, so teach me. So I, I'm, I, you know, here's the selfish reason why I host this podcast. I'm, I'm trying to learn. I'm just learning about new people and new things. Okay. So teach me, you said uh, one of the styles that you liked was neo soul teach me what neo soul is i've heard of soul music i'm not sure and i know what neo means but i, I don't know tell, explain that to me well i said neo soul because I, I guess if somebody was to listen to me play they would classify that as more like neo soulish so to maybe give an artist that's neo soulish would be more like uh music soul child uh erica badu mm -hmm. uh jill scott more of your underground artist okay. type of stuff um, but neo soul is is I think is just music where because you know all music and regardless if it's neo soul rap it it 
it you know makes people move a certain way but i think neo soul is more of a positive music it's you know it's not out here about you know the guns and the violence is just more so about expressing yourself whether it's expressing yourself with love or expressing yourself with whatever you want to feel or however you're feeling you just kind of play and you sing and you just express yourself and you allow your soul to speak because those that are listening can feel i guess your soul in that but i guess me saying neo soul is just me trying to classify um my style of sound when it comes to me singing or playing the guitar or you know writing poetry or little things like that so now uh, i'm going to take a risk here michael yeah because i didn't know this would come up but do you do you happen to have a guitar right next to you near you i have one two three i have four guitars yes <laughs> oh good you have options would you play something <laughs> i would say i plead the fifth <laughs> I put you on the spot. No expectation. I get it. I get it. Maybe in a few minutes, you'll, you know, grace us with something. Just a, a 30 seconds. I would just love to hear something. 30 seconds. You don't have to. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, but I will bring it back up. Um, so what you also mentioned reading and I, I'm a huge reader myself. What are you reading lately? Um, now I'm kind of, I ended up reading this book from, um, Ernest Holmes and it was called the science of mind. Um, and it was just a very different book, a very unique book, which just kind of gave um, a different outlook on life. You know, I think growing up, we are all um, I always say the thing is like, you know, when a chicken is hatched out of an egg and if let's say if it's a snake, if a chicken hatches from egg and it sees a snake, it's going to believe that that snake is its mother. So whatever that snake says, it's going to believe it. So I think all of us, as we grow up, we are conditioned to believe the things that our parents and, you know, society tells us to believe. And there are so many different books and so many different things out there that give different perspectives, different ways of thinking and um, learning. And um, so it's the science of mind, but Ernest, I really dove into that book and read that. Um, and that kind of expanded me into looking into other things. And, um, you know, kind of right now, a quote that kind of stuck out to me was that, you know, one's intelligence is limited by the language that they, they speak. Hmm. You know, your intelligence is limited by the language that you speak. Um, and so I just really been reading books that challenge um, uh, societal views that challenged um, the ways that we think um, and just be keep myself open minded to everything. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm closed minded at all. I actually, um, you know, going to college and meeting other people, you know, I grew up Christian and, you know, meeting other people that were Buddhist, that were, you know, Muslim and all these different religions and backgrounds and, you know, to learn more about them and learn um, why they believe what they believe or believe how they believe and you know, and to not shun them for having a different viewpoint than you have. Um, and then even to this day now, all I do is I sit down and I read and, you know, now I'm, you know, reading this numbers, you know, what do numbers mean, you know, just little things like that. So yeah. just to keep myself challenged because it, it, everything can be so mundane and you almost feel like you're on a hamster wheel in life if you're constantly doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, that if you're not expanding your mind, um, then you're going to find yourself feeling like you're stuck on a hamster wheel doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. So I love that analogy and bringing it back to when you're talking about talking with some of your coaching friends and, you know, we always end up talking about recruiting. Uh, you know, if you go into the little, you mentioned convention, if you go into the little pods and you know, everybody gets in their little groups, if you mm -hmm. go into those groups, they're probably talking about the same thing. They're probably talking about training or recruiting or the what if off oh, my athlete would have done, listen to me here, you know, those kind of, it's kind of the same right uh, hamster wheel ish if you will H how do you so, so how do you take what you're learning there and apply it to your coaching because you know your athletes are really on <clears throat> hand right they're they're going to class every day they're going to practice every day uh, right now they're doing all of that and no payoff meaning no saturday meets <laughs> right yeah uh, so how, how do you pull all that back into track and help your athletes out well, as a as a coach, we you you recruit to your personality, um, and I, I think with all the stuff that the more you read and the more you die, it, it allows you to be able to engage in different conversations. It, I think it allows you to um, reach student athletes that maybe your personalities aren't you know, similar. Um, and so it just allows you to be very open-minded to be able to be receptive to everybody, all the different um, personalities, all the different viewpoints in life. And, you know, if you was to have a student athlete um, behave or say something, 
say something, you know, different or certain, then it allows you to be open and receptive to that, to be able to, because at the end of the day, they're still looking up to you as, as a mentor or somebody to uh, say, again, guide their stride. And I think with, um, you know, as coaches, we recruit international students who, you know, come from different faiths and different backgrounds and, you know, all those different things like that, that I think, you know, the more you expand what it is that you know, the more you're able to actually reach everybody, um, and, and help them without feeling, having them feel like they're being judged or ostracized or, you know, things like that. So I think for me, it just allows me to be able to, as a head coach, to be able to communicate with not just my student athletes, but my coaching staff, because I bring in other staff members who aren't like me, you know, or to be able to talk with the administrator. Because I think we all <laughs> work with administrators where we may not see eye to eye, um, you know, but I just think for me, it's, it's just allowed me to have a positive, um, for everyone else to have a positive viewpoint of, of myself, you know, and it allows me to engage in conversations. And, um, you know, sometimes when you have certain situations with student athletes where they're not seeing things the way that, you know, you, you need them to see them, um, it just allows you to, you know, use certain words or be able to, you know, change the conversation to be able to find some type of focal point to get the athletes to understand certain things or to kind of have them um, open up to you. Because I think the one of the most dangerous things as a coach is to have athletes that don't open up to you. You can't help them if they don't open up to you. Yeah, that's the, I don't say it's the big challenge of coaching because there's a lot of challenges of course. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, uh, you know, a reoccur reoccurring theme we have here with uh, really great coaches on our podcast is the coaching the person, not the events. And what you just described there, you know, have, uh, earning that trust, giving that trust uh, so that you can have the athlete open up to you. Well, mm -hmm. boy, that's coaching the person 101 right there. I'm curious, you know, I, I love your attitude about being curious. Like that's like, I resonates with me a, a lot. Uh, the different books that you read and the, uh, you know, those four guitars that are back there that one of them's yelling to be played for just a, just a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, as a self-admitted introvert, how hard was it to be on this podcast? And what I mean by that is most introverts are not going to put themselves out, talk about their history, talk about themselves. I mean, we're, you know, this is all about uplifting and honoring you, Michael. Um, so it's a little hard, I think, for an introvert. I, I know it's hard for an introvert to be on the show. Mm -hmm. what, what made you, you didn't have to say yes to me. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you did, by the way, but what, what how hard was it and, and what were you hoping to accomplish? Um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that hard, but you know, once, I th once you put on Twitter, you was looking for people to interview and, you know, coaches that I know was like, you know, you should interview, you know, and I have, and I happened to check Twitter that day and I never checked Twitter. So I right. happened to check Twitter that day. And I was like, you know what, I'll do it. Um, I and right. So I was like, you know what, I'll do it. And, um, so it wasn't, it wasn't hard. I mean, it really, for me, I'm, I'm an introvert, but if you know me and if you sit down and have a conversation with me, I can talk a lot, but if I don't know you, um, I may not be the conversation starter. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do thank those people that recommended me for, um, doing it. Cause, and then I guess the time and the space of what it was, I actually was checking Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's so, a, big deal when you get nominated for the pot it's one thing if i reach out and that that's also a big deal because that means you know like i thought of you enough like hey i think you'd be a great guest on the show uh but to me there is no higher honor than when another coach nominates another co and i shouldn't even say coach when another person nominates another coach that to me and you you're right you had several people that were like hey uh michael up at northwood you should interview him uh and that was interesting to me uh that people nominated you and then totally forgot that you're not a, a social media guy and that you, the star, no. the stars lined up and you happen to check it the, there in that time period. That's awesome. It was meant to be Michael. It was meant to be. I, I, hey, I guess so. <laughs> well, Michael, as we wrap up today, man, uh, I'm just so thankful for you. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to say no to me to play just, just 30 seconds, just a little, just give me a little strum, something original if you have, because I'm sure they'll take me off the airwaves if I, if we play uh, Erica. Oh, right. Yeah. If I yeah, play yeah, something yeah. original, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not like the, but let me go grab it. I'm not like the best guitar player. That doesn't matter. I, I can't play at all. So you are a hundred percent better than I am. You know, I remember my dad bought a set of drums and he, 
um, there was a guitar. I still have it too. And they gave me the guitar and I've always kind of just played the guitar and I don't have any formal lesson. I can't read music. I can't do any of that. All the thing I can do is grab really? the guitar. I can't. The only thing that I can do with the guitar is grab it and play, I guess, and you also play with my soul is telling me to yes, yes, yes. Um, play. So I don't know. Hold on. Now, I do have Snapchat stuff like that. If people on there, I may play, you know, I, I may do some crazy things on there, but nothing, nothing too serious. But I don't know. Mm. Hold on. Okay. And then sometimes what I'll do is if I'm feeling a poem or something, <laughs> I'll just start freestyling or putting on there. Or I remember for like Halloween, I did this thing called like Demon Chronicles. I don't know why I did that, but I got on there and I started like, it was on Snapchat. You had like a little filter where like showing your face and I got into character and I started, um, you know, really getting into full character that and posting on social media. And people was like, it's a little catchy. I was like, I know. <laughs> So Dude, thank you for doing that. I know that was tough. I put you on the spot. Yeah, no problem. Hey, but but you know what? Putting somebody on the spot gives you the the truest reaction um, out of them. It doesn't give them time to think about nothing. So what you get from them is the soul. The soul. <laughs> that's right. The soul right there. Well, that's what you know. A, a, a big goal of mine here with the podcast. You know, it's a very specific reason why I named it Connections. And it mm -hmm. is to connect, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of friends and family and, you know, at least Cooper will listen to this episode, right? Like at least one, you know, he'll, he'll listen, uh, Jarius will listen to it. We got at least one listener for this episode, right? Uh, but the real value to me is the other people that don't know Michael Roberts that are going to listen to this. And, and it's, All right. Uh, we have a pretty good audience. I'm proud of the, you know, uh, we must be given some value because we're getting a, a lot of, uh, of listeners and downloads. And that is what is important to me is that someone who uh, doesn't know Northwood University, doesn't know Michael Roberts, hears your story today and just, you know, the amazing pedigree of coaches you've went through and Lawrence Central, which is a powerhouse and then Indiana State, which is a, you know, historic hurdle program and track program in general, and then to go on and become a head coach at such a young age. Uh, I hope, I, I know, not a hope, I know someone out there is going to listen and hear your story and they're gonna be emboldened. They're gonna like, wait a minute, if he can do it, I can do it. I'm, I'm a kid from Indianapolis. He did it too, I can do it. You know, that's, that to me is what is important and that you are, that people see the change and positive effect that you're having in your area. And that's what I love about you being at Northwood. You do not have to be at a Michigan State, University of Texas, whatever. No. You have the power to make huge, positive influence over athletes, over 18 to 22 year olds here in the college level and the friends and administrators and coaches that you work with in your area. You have a huge, huge uh, uh, ability to make a positive impact where you are. And I truly believe that if everybody has that attitude, so from Midland, Michigan to Midland, Texas to <laughs> Midland, Maryland, you know, uh, all around, if we all just focus on our area whether it's big or small, doesn't matter if you, if you focus on your area and make positive changes, well, then the whole world will become infinitely better. We'll 10X this mm -hmm. whole world to be much, much more positive. You don't have to be uh, in New York City and a uh, Twitter follower of 100,000, you know, those kind of things. You can affect where you are right now. And my man, that is what you are doing right there at Northward University. And I couldn't be more proud. You're doing a great job. Thank you. I'm so thankful uh, for you to join us today. Uh, I'm so thankful that you got out of your comfort zone a little bit and played for us, man. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I got the sweat rolling down my armpits from nervousness, you know, so. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that, man. I really do appreciate it. And I really do appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's a wrap, folks. Uh, I just want to thank... Michael, so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate, uh, you know, honestly, his authenticity and openness to share with us. Uh, this has definitely been one of the more 
uh, open and authentic uh, conversations we've had here on the podcast. And I'm just so thankful for that. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's episode, would you consider subscribing to the show? And really, even more importantly, if you found value in this conversation, I'm pretty sure others in your network would too. Uh, hit that share button, let the world know, Facebook, Twitter, not Michael, he's never on it. So he's not going to know if you share it or not. Uh, <laughs> but the rest of the world will know about it. And, uh, and that would just mean the world to me and to all of our guests and their stories and their journeys here in the coaching world. So uh, see you next week. We'll have another awesome coach here on the Connections Podcast.